Bonjour. Join us as we chat about France and find out where you should go outside of Paris. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. This week's episode is brought to us by Enchanting Barcelona, which offers kid-centric tours with outstanding guides that will take your family vacation from good to great. Incorporating educational games encourages young children to teens to get involved in learning about Barcelona's top sites. You can learn more at EnchantingBarcelonaTours.com. Well, hello, Kim. Hi, Tamara. It's good to chat with you via, you know, online, even though I just saw you. I know. I was going to say long time no see. Yeah. I was so happy to have my first experience in New York City with you. I cannot believe that it was my first time visiting that city. And now I'm back again. But thankfully, you gave me a good lesson. I navigated the subway alone yesterday are you proud of me i am and i actually walked through central park and i was not scared that i was going to be killed or mugged of course it's <laughs> the daytime but it's gorgeous in there so i had all of that thanks to you <laughs> it is i was telling glenn about that i was teaching you how to navigate and he was like it's a grid what's so hard i'm like but you still have to know if you're heading north the street numbers go up and you know how to which ways the avenues go and yeah, so absolutely but once you once you figure that out, you're good, at least until you go downtown. Yeah, yeah. I was good. I'm here, you know, in Midtown or is this Manhattan or wherever I'm at. And so You I are kinda, in Manhattan. Yeah, so I kind of knew a little bit and it made sense. My hardest thing was when I got on the subway, I had to really think because there's 8 million signs saying different things like Brooklyn, Harlem, all these different. And I was like, okay. And then I finally figured out like Uptown. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go Uptown. That I know that's right. And so I took that subway because that's one thing Google Maps as a novice, that's something that my Google Maps doesn't tell me. Right. So when you know that you need to take the B train at that station, you go down there, but then there's two options for B trains. So you have to know what direction you need to be on. So yeah, that that's what I was trying tricky. to tell you too. That sometimes even which entrance you go into, like they don't always cross over. So sometimes you need to go down the stairs for yes. the uptown or the downtown. Right. Some stations are connected, but not all of them are. Yeah. And even I thought I was going to go to the, like the 42nd and Bryant Street one. And it actually, where I thought I was going to get the subway entrance, I was walking along 6th Ave and there was another entrance for it. And it was marked 42nd and Bryant, but I was not on 42nd Street yet. So yeah, it was interesting. yeah. Like, so it was a, a sneaky extra entry or something. I don't know. But I still survived. I did it. I came out right um, next to Central Park and, of course, the American Museum of Natural History, and it worked just fine. Yeah, so you really got to see some of the top sites because when we were in town, we visited a few of the museums and attractions, too. I, I know. I I cannot believe how much, just the little bit of time I had, but we, we did see a lot, and some really amazing things. I was blown away at how gorgeous the Met is. You know, not, um, of course, the exhibits are gorgeous in themselves and there's some really unique artifacts and art, but the building itself is also gorgeous and the way it's all laid out is, it's just fun to walk around that museum even. Yeah. Well, did you ever read the the book? Um, it's like the mixed up files of Basil E. Frank a while or, or something like that. Nope. Did you ever read that when you were a kid? So it's about these two little kids. And so like a really old book, it's about these two little kids that they run away from home and they live in the Met. And mm-hmm. every night they come out and they take money from the fountain and that's how they have like money, I guess, to eat or whatever. I can't remember exactly. And they just kind of explore the Met on their own. And I don't know. I always loved that book. And so the first time we took Hannah to the Met, I bought her that book afterwards because, of course, they sell it there. But that's what I love about that building. It's just so fun to explore that building. And so I think that's why that book like talked to me, because it was imagine doing it like after hours with no one else around, you know, and how fun that could be. So, yeah, it definitely makes me think of what I did yesterday because I kept thinking that Ben Stiller was going to come out any moment now with the T-Rex at the American Museum of Natural History. And uh, yeah, that, that place is pretty scary, I think, to be in at night. Yes. There's yeah. Even of, before the movie. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a gorgeous museum, another gorgeous museum that was a lot of fun to walk around and um, kind of explore. And I had a little insider tip because I, when I checked in, I don't know if you know this, but for our listeners who maybe have never been, never been or 
are thinking about going, uh, when I mentioned that it was my first time visiting and asked if there was any tips, he said start at floor four and work your way down. That was his tip. So I thought that oh, was a, good. Yeah, it was kind of a cool tip. And sure enough, like I could see as I was going down, you know, lots of people were coming up because as people come, I think they start on the lower levels and eventually work their way up. But by starting on the top, it was even though I got there midday, um, it was pretty light. And I worked my That's way down. That's good. So, yeah. Because if you, if you go on the weekend, it's insane. It's just so, so crowded. And I'm sure sometimes there's like a lot of um, field trips and things too. Yeah, but. the field trips were just leaving. That was another perk, I think, of going. I think I got there around one. And that was another. I saw three big buses pulled up outside and all the kids were coming and getting on the buses. So, I can only So, imagine. there you go. <laughs> one week. Midweek and after, afternoon, that's the time to, to go then. Yeah, I think so. And start on the fourth floor and work your way down. But it was definitely, you could see also the ropes uh, that they had for even just getting the tickets. And even though I had the city pass, you still have to go through the ticket line and turn it in uh, for your ticket. And just that alone, there was, you know, it was like a TSA, pre, TSA line, yeah. line, you know, but mine w- was empty. I, that happened to I us when I went with, with Hannah in the fall before we were going to see Hamilton in the afternoon. So we only had a certain amount of time, but she wanted to go to the planetarium because Neil deGrasse Tyson is the narrator of the shows. And, you know, so she really wanted to go and do that. And I thought, OK, we have a couple hours, no problem. But we waited at least half an hour in line just to get the ticket. So oh, um, it kind of limited how much time we had in the museum. So oh, that is definitely yeah. something to think about. Yeah, I had no, and we really like that the two of us. We really lucked out. That's good. We really lucked out when we went to the Empire State Building because you saw yes. all the velvet ropes <laughs> there and how long those lines can be. Yes, and you know that that was an. I I really lucked out. I think maybe you know I don't know. Definitely midweek and winter seems to be a good time if you don't care about the cold and wanna. True, but it, it was it was pretty cold up there on the Empire State Building <laughs> and very windy, right? But on the that other side, it's calmer. So it's like one side can be windy, the other side can be calm. Yeah, it was definitely a little windy and cold, but, you know, only made it nicer when we had our Opera Ski uh, happy hour drinks, right? Yes. <laughs> Indoor. <laughs> With all the melted cheese. Yeah, yes. that was yummy. So So, from what you've seen so far, do you have any tips? Because you also did, you should tell people about how you got into the city because that was, that was a good traveler move of you. You didn't just take a cab. I know. Aren't you proud of me? I'm, I, uh, I already have plans to write a post about it, but yeah. So my first time into the city, I actually had advice from friends. And so I took the air train at JFK and it's kind of like the terminal train that takes you between terminals, but it also has a stop that you can take it to the Jamaica Long Island Railroad and Jamaica Station. And at once I got there, I asked a guy who was, you know, a Metro employee guy, and he told me to buy a ticket. And so I bought this ticket for the Long Island Railroad. I bought a one-way ticket. And then I had to add on a $5 subway card as well to just walk through the subway to go to the railroad, which seems a little ridiculous to me. But still, all together, it was fifteen twenty-five. I walked through the subway turnstiles, walked over to the railroad, and I went down. It was so cool. I felt like really east, you know, I almost felt European and definitely east coast. But I walked down to the train tracks and waited. And, you know, all these commuters, all these people were waiting because I got in um, pretty early in the morning. And then the train came and I shuffled on with the millions of people, you know, shoveling on. We got in there. I had my suitcase. I found a seat, sat down. And then I actually took that all the way into a Penn station, which is a big subway station, came up and then walked to the uh, thing. So a cab is normally $52 uh, flat fee. And I think they charge like taxes and stuff on top of that. You come out of it paying 60 or 70 or something. So I paid fifteen twenty-five and had you know, no problems whatsoever. Of course, it was daylight. I heard that, you know, you don't necessarily want to do that late at night. And then, so when I returned to the airport the next day, it was a 4 a.m. ish departure and it was all dark out. And I just felt a little unsure. So I did take something called dial seven that time, which was another thing that uh, another traveling friend had told me. And it's kind of like a private car service. And it was $54 for the one way but I had a $6 coupon, so it made a 48 and then I tipped the guy. So, 
Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's where you have to figure out, like, if you're traveling with kids, you know, and you're coming in, especially commuter time, trying to get onto that train with luggage and kids would be a nightmare because you're probably going to not be together. Um, And then the cost, you know, if you have a family of four, maybe it's worth it just to take the cab. But if you're coming in by yourself, then it saves you a lot of money to take the train. So yeah, that was exactly what I was thinking. I was like, since I was solo, it made sense. But a family, it definitely is easier. I've heard also someone gave me a heads up, like not to do Uber or Lyft from the airport because... Um, the numbers somehow get inflated really easily. So I'm not sure how true that is, but it's nice to know that the taxis have flat fees and they really seem to know their way around the city. And, you know, the private car service too, with the dial seven is really convenient and it, I don't see how it's any different than a cab and it's a little nicer. So that's an option too. Yeah. When I used to live in the city, we used to always call and order a car service to pick up. And I wonder if it was the same because it's like Carmel was seven, 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 you know, like their number was a bunch (laughs) of sevens. So maybe they've changed their branding. I don't know. Yeah. But But yeah. But yeah. So you are now an experienced uh, New York City visitor. (laughs) At least traveler. Midtown Manhattan. Midtown. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I don't know if I could handle anything else, but I feel pretty confident right here. But do you have anything else on your agenda to visit while you're in town this time? I don't think so. We're just enjoying, I'm here with Paul. So we are enjoying going out to dinner each night. And that's another tip, thanks to you, that I warned him about. And that's open table. So I, uh, you know, I've been checking for reservations each night and making a little reservation for us because it can really pay off. It's, you know, some of those restaurants get pretty crammed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you you definitely will need a reservation at a lot of them, especially in, in a place like Midtown. So, yeah. But it's definitely a good, I mean, I think that's what, where we are. So you and I stayed off 37th and 7th. Is that right? And right now, okay. And right now, Paul and I are off like 6th Ave and 38th. And 6th Ave is really a great, you know, even up to 8th. Like those, it's a perfect location because you can really get around easily. Yes. Yeah. And it's a little cleaner and nicer than between eighth and ninth. Oh. Although our, where we stayed was, was pretty, um, it, I was surprised. I was, I was happy with where we stayed. Yeah. I thought everything, I, I didn't notice anything. It was all good. I, I mean, Times Square is definitely the one area that I think tourists would want to go to, but it was interesting just chatting because the Times Square area, um, a lot of that theater district is, you know, a little grungier, I think, than where, yeah. where we're at. So, Yeah. It is. It gets a lot of people in there. All right. Well, good. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your trip. And now we're going to get to talk about another place that you want to go. or You wanted to take me, right? Yeah, definitely. En français. Oui? No. You sound so much better than I do. So you're ready to go. (laughs) Yeah, We'll see. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know how to say let's go in Mm. French, so... Me neither. And I'm going to Martinique in a month or two, and I have to learn a little bit of French just to get by there. So got to load up your Duolingo. Exactly. <laughs> Those apps are perfect. So yeah, let's exactly. definitely chat all about France. Great. Okay, we are here this week with Barbara Weinling. She's traveled all of her life since she was a child. She attended the Lycée Français and she is fluent in French and has lived in Paris. She is now a travel advisor for Ciao Bambino, which is a website and travel agency specializing in family travel. She lives in Providence with her 14-year-old son and husband and dog, right? Yes. So welcome, Barbara. Thank you for having me. Or I guess we're supposed to say bonjour, right? And you can say bonjour. <laughs> she says it much better. <laughs> yeah. I think she's going to be correcting our French for most of this uh, episode. Yeah. I'll try not to. I, I'm happy not to. <laughs> all, I, all I've got is bonjour and au revoir and maybe croissant. <laughs> Pano chocolat. Ooh. Oh, there you go. Nice. That was nice. <laughs> Great. So, Barbara, did you want to give us anything else about your background or a little more about yourself before we start talking all about France? Sure. I, as you said, I'm fluent in French. I spoke French at home. My father was born and raised in Belgium uh, at a time when French was um, the first language there. So that's what we sometimes spoke at home. And we have spent summers in Cannes, which is on the French Riviera, um, for a few years, which my mother adored. I uh, did live in France years ago, and then I've been going back pretty steadily ever since. 
we have friends with whom we stayed. And then when my son was three, we rented a home down on the Riviera, actually in the hills behind. And now we've returned the last two summers to explore new parts of France that I hadn't had a chance to visit in quite some time. See, this is exactly why when I knew we wanted to do an episode on France, I turned to you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm very excited about this episode because I don't know if Tamara told you, but my youngest is that is right now that's her bucket list destination. That's where she wants me to take her is Paris, of course, is the main one or Paris, I guess. But she's very excited. So I cannot wait to chat about that. And are you so just living there in France? Then have you been vacationing back there as well? Is that kind of why you're an expert? Yeah, I've always vacationed back there. We'll spend a couple of days because I had friends kind of all over. I'd go and visit them. I've skied there. We've beached there. We visited Paris there. I did it singly. I did it with my family. And there's just so much to do there. And it was very um, comfortable because I spoke French so well and my husband can fumble by. And now because my son has been studying it in school, he has a greater interest in it. That's yeah, that's perfect. Neat. Yeah. So I think a lot of people think about Paris and they don't always think uh, what else they can do in France. So I was hoping today we can really go into some of that. Like what, you know, what are some of the different regions and what do you do beyond Paris? So can you start us out with, you know, if someone has maybe um, 10 days or, or two weeks to spend in France, what they would do? Like what are some of the regions that they might visit, assuming that they're going to do at least a few days in Paris? Okay, so France is quite a bit deeper and um, larger than you would expect. They have the TGV, which is the super fast trains, which are often quicker than driving. Sometimes it's better to take the TGV and then pick up your car there. You do have to know that the train system, though, is set up very much like a hub and spoke. So um, often you end up going back to Paris. So you really have to plan how you want to do this and where you want to go because, for example, going from east to west is not that easy. Mm-hmm. Within Paris, there are also the suburbs, which you can get to by local trains like Versailles, 40 minutes on the RER, or Giverny, where Monet lived and painted the water lilies. Mm-hmm. And there are a couple of other small castles like le vicomte or Fontainebleau, which really are no more than 30 or 40 minutes and are really very kid-friendly. But if you're going to go out side of Paris, there are a couple of different ways you can go. So traditionally, people will go to Normandy, uh, which is directly west, and maybe they'll go south to Brittany to see Mont Saint-Michel, and they might circle back, or they might then continue on to the Loire Valley, which is where all the big famous chateaus are. And that can be quite fun. You can go cycling, you can go, um, Mont Saint-Michel is this big medieval town that is surrounded by water and when the tide comes up you can't go and when the tide goes down you go and of course Normandy everybody thinks of the D-Day and the beaches of Normandy they do have a very child-friendly museum but personally sometimes I think it's better when kids are maybe teens or later teens and they can understand a little more about what they're seeing in that area there's also Etretat which is a very famous how can I say, it's on the beaches and it's a hole created through the stones. So it's really quite scenic or Enfleur or Deauville, which are Atlantic beaches. Okay, so talking about the hub and spoke, do you have a you know, specific kind of layout or itinerary you would recommend for maybe first-time visitors? If they do want to do a few days in Paris, say, how many days should they, you know, if they have 10 to 14 days to spend in France, what would you recommend they do to navigate Well, what I would suggest is four or five days in Paris. Don't forget, you'll be very tired that first day you arrive. And then from there, um, there are various areas of Paris, of France, you can go to depending on your interests. And the trains will take anywhere between two hours and five hours, uh, depending on where you want to go and what is of interest. So you can kind of select uh, whether you want to go west, south, or east. Going in between those destinations can be uh, a little tricky. And you can move, I would say, maybe three times in a 12-day trip. Uh, Beyond that, it gets to be a little challenging for kids unless they really want to move every two days. 
And what I would suggest is an overview, just to give you an idea of regions. To the east is Alsace, to the west is Normandy. South, just a little bit, Bay, about an hour and a half or two, is the Loire. Southwest is Brittany. If you keep on going south, you'll hit the Dordogne. And beyond that, Languedoc-Roussillon, which is a wonderful alternative to Provence, which is to the east of that. And what a lot of people don't realize is Provence and the Côte d'Azur, Riviera, are actually two different adjacent regions. And you would want to start your trip from maybe different points. So a classic trip would be to start in Paris, take the TGV to, say, Avignon, which is part of Provence, spend maybe four days in Provence and then drive because the trains are not as convenient, although it can be done, to the Côte d'Azur and maybe stay in the hills behind the beaches because the beaches tend to get very crowded and it's a narrow winding road. But there, if you stay just in the small hills behind, it's only about 20 minutes to the beach. Hmm. That's good. Uh, so, so kind of like two two to three regions in a two week. And do you think if you did something like that, would you fly back out of uh, like Nice or would you go back to Paris? That would be my preference. If you can, it's best to fly into Paris and fly out of Nice, which is an easy airport to fly in and out of, hmm. um, and has a lot of nonstop flights in season, not so much out of season, back to the U.S. Um, or you connect through Paris or London or Munich. All of those are easy connections from the Nice airport. What are the good seasons for traveling to France for maybe, you know, Americans? Look, May, September, October are wonderful. Most of us can't do that with our kids' schedules. So then you're into June, and I would say till about mid-July. July and August can be very, very crowded, particularly down in the south. And that's when I might recommend some other areas, like Languedoc-Roussillon, um, which is extremely family-friendly, and you still have access to some of the Roman sites and the medieval castles, uh, or the Dordogne, which has the prehistoric cave paintings. Down by the Côte d'Azur in August, it will be packed. All of France is on vacation. Most mm -hmm. of Europe is on vacation. So those la that last four to six weeks of the summer can be very crowded. That being said, I have traveled the last week in August, if your school kids start school just a little later, and then you have mostly just the Brits and the Americans because the French have started to head home to prepare, prepare for school, which starts right around September 1st. That's good to know. Is there like a rainy season or it's more just based on like school schedules? Well, in France, they have two weeks of vacation in October, the Christmas break, two weeks in uh, one or two weeks in February, and then two weeks in the March to April area. The way France is set up is they're often on sequential breaks. So two weeks for one region, two weeks for another, and two weeks for not, and get a third. They're divided mm. into three regions. The breaks, though, it's really Christmas that's crowded and August that's very crowded. Winter is rainy. You have to remember that, say, for example, New York is on the same parallel as Madrid. So Paris is quite a bit further north, it tends to be grayer and rainier in the off season, um, but it will also be less crowded. And certainly October in um, the south of France is very, very pleasant. I was there in December and it was lovely. It was not beach weather, but it was very, very nice. However, many properties do close in the off season, and that's when they freshen up and refurbish. Mm, that's good to know. So, do you think we can go into what some of these regions have to offer? And maybe I know some of them have very different styles and personalities too. So, maybe you can walk us through at least some of the most popular ones for families. So, different regions have very different characters which is really surprising to most people. So one of my favorite regions is to the east, which is Alsace, and that was part of the time taken over by Germany. So you'll see a big German influence. So you'll have things like pretzels right next to the favorite French pastry of macaron, which mm -hmm. are those little cookies with stuffings in the middle and bright colors. And that, has, that area is full of child-friendly um, activities like monkey sanctuaries and birds of prey show and rebuilt castles. And lots of wine, by the way, where we were fine taking um, our son. If you go in the exact opposite direction, you go to Normandy, which is very well known for D-Day and their beaches and some of their 
beautiful scenery. That is, by the way, the only area of France that is not a wine region. That is the region of butter and alcoholic cider. And of Ooh. course, if you do, yes. <laughs> Kim's like, well, I'll put it in. <laughs> like, that's my region. <laughs> really good. <laughs> and if you go just a little south, you're into the Loire Valley, which is where, of course, the castles are, and you can go cycling and pretty countryside. All of those areas are about two hours at most by train, and then you have to drive around. Do However, you think, is, do you think the Loire Valley is, is kid friendly? Moderate, yes, it can be because you can go cycling along the road. And you can go explore the castles. It's not always my first choice for children. Um, I just think after a while, one castle may look like another, but they are very good at their kids' programming. And there are three major castles to see there. Um, and they really are quite spectacular. And don't forget, they have their gardens, and the kids can go run in the gardens. What are the three that you would recommend? Blois, B-L-O-I-S, Chenonceau, yeah. which is C-H, and um, Chambord, which is also known for its liquor, C-H-A-M-B-O-R-D. Most people, however, like to go south. And you can get down to Avignon, two hours and 40 minutes on the TGV and pick up a car there. That's faster than you can drive. And that's in Provence? That is in Provence. And from there, if you um, have very patient children, you can drive maybe... Mm, not quite an hour north and visit Chateau Neuf du Pape wine country, but you will have to bribe your kids. You can go due west and then you go into the mountains of the Luberon, which is what everybody thinks of with the lavender. However, mm. the lavender season is only from mid June to maybe mid July, and then they cut it down and harvest it. And that's a lot of outdoor and hiking and, and um, exploratory area like that. You can drop, um, which I prefer to do, is it's about an hour south of Avignon. You can go to Saint-Rémy, which is R-E-M-Y. And from there, you can make a good base of exploring Al, which is where they have a wonderful Roman amphitheater, a fabulous modern museum, and like an airport hangar. And they have other, they have, it's also the Van Gogh Foundation is there. Saint-Rémy itself has a wonderful Wednesday market. And by the way, the markets are totally kid-friendly. You grab some handheld sausages, some, some sweets, and I found my kids totally engaged because they give tastings out everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it's just a wonderful plethora of fruits and vegetables. This is known as the bread basket of France. And you can also go and see um, the Chateau des Beaux, it's B-A-U-X, and that's a medieval castle, and they have some wonderful reenactments, and they're very farcical. You really don't need to be able to um, speak or understand French to enjoy them. In fact, my son told me to stop translating. He, I was disturbing him. <laughs> and then they also have, and you have to find the schedule online, they have trebuchets, what do you call catapults. They've rebuilt, and you can watch them launch the catapults. So this castle is somewhat in ruins, but it's still great fun. And then about a five-minute walk from there, there is the Carrière de Lumière, which is the Quarry of Light. And they change it every year, but they do a kind of light and sound show in here of all the different paintings. So they might do Chagall, they might do Hiroshima's Bosch, and they show parts and images and there's music. And it's wonderful. And it's crowds and it's just all around you. And then when you have enough, you leave. And they also have a cute little cafe that had the best donuts I had in France, um, which you know, was greatly appreciated as a snack. So you can visit those two as part of one day. And then also you can drive an hour to Aix-en-Provence, which is a university town, um, as is, by the way, Strasbourg in Alsace. And so that is where Cézanne was born and raised, and he had his atelier. And that has a wonderful pedestrian street that you can explore. And it's just a fun, lively town. Saint-Rémy, to go back there, also has um, the asylum where Van Gogh was institutionalized and some Roman ruins, although um, you will find that throughout that part of France. Mm -hmm. And then for an activity day, when you can do this, you can be based anywhere there, just will be a longer, shorter drive. One of the most fun things to do is rent, they call it canoes, but they're really more like kayaks. You put together a picnic, they give you a big plastic barrel. You put your food in there and your water in there, and off you go down the river. And we chose to do it 
eight kilometers, which meant we did most of the rowing and my son swam and pushed and played. But and we pulled off to the side for a picnic and we went under the famous aqueduct of Pont du Gard. And you can see it from below. And about 20 minutes past that, you pull out and there'll be a little van waiting. And when they have enough people, they take you back to your car. And then you can drive and visit the Pont du Gard from above. Hmm. And this is the famous aqueduct, the three levels that you see. And they also have a wonderful museum which shows how it was built, how it functioned. Totally kid-friendly and engaging. And if you kind of do museum and outdoor time and picnic time, it's great. I would recommend you wear your bathing suit when you get there because otherwise you've kind of got to change under a towel by a by your car, which is not always the most convenient <laughs> thing. So those are all day trips within Provence, right? All within Provence, yeah. Hmm. So it definitely I mean, sounds like you could spend, what would you recommend, like five days to a week there? Well, we actually spent 12 days and didn't even see everything. So mm. just to give yourself a taste, you can do four days there. As I said, I also spent 12 days in Alsace because we just love that area with all a different type of kid-friendly atmosphere. Provence, however, can be very expensive, particularly in season. And so if you want a more economical and extremely family-friendly option, just go west about two hours. You could take a train to Montpellier, which is about five hours on the train. And there you have the Languedoc-Roussillon, which has access to the beaches, generally about 20, 30, 40 minutes. It also has canoeing. Yeah, you could, it's about a two-hour drive to Nîmes, which has one of the largest coliseums. And then you can visit the wonderful Cathar castles, which are um, exemplified by Carcassonne, which is this enormous, well, it's not enormous, but it's completely walled medieval town. And at the very top, of course, is the church. And uh, How do you spell that fun. one? C-A-R-C-A-S-S-O-N-N-E. Okay. I feel like I need a map. (laughs) I was like, I can visualize that now that you spelled it for me. Um, And that is a great, I, they also, what they also have there are uh, the French equivalent of agriturismos. So you can get independent villas or, or um, apartments or rooms within a resort that has a restaurant, has a pool, has a kids club so that you can relax. And then when you want to go out, you venture out um, for your fun day. It's a very relaxed area. And it's really all about families, a lot of French there. You do have to know which beaches to go to. Some are a little more family friendly than others. Others (laughs) are a little more geared toward uh, different grounds, different crowds and different stages of dress. (laughs) But it it really is a a lovely, lovely area. And as I said, Go ahead. Do you, you feel like that has some similarities to Provence and that it has like small towns to visit and, and Wonderful things like markets, that. Yeah. access to beaches and medieval castles. The The only thing is some of the, if you're into Cezanne and Van Gogh and the other post-impressionists, that you don't find as much. That is more in, uh, in Provence or on the Côte d'Azur, which is going the opposite way and south. So mm-hmm. from, say, Saint-Rémy, uh, it would be maybe three hours drive, depending where you're going on the Côte d'Azur, because that is a very long stretch. How easy um, is it to drive around these regions? You keep mentioning, you know, like getting a car, I guess. How it's easy very is it easy. Okay. It's very easy. It's very forthright. I do recommend an international driver's license. And the only thing to know, well, there are two things. One is um, they have priorité à droite, which means people coming in from the right have priority. So you just got to keep that in mind. They have a lot of roundabouts and they have one of the strictest drinking and driving laws in in the world, believe it or not, for all their drinking or maybe because of all their drinking. (laughs) But it's really, really simple because what you have to know is that when you drive, everything's in the direction of. So, you know, if you're going to go north, it's going to be in the direction of Avignon or Lyon. If you're going south, it's going to be toward Nice or toward Marseille. I've, the highways are super easy. Um, the only thing to know with highways, if you go through where there's a credit card, they don't take American credit cards because all of ours are chip and sign, not chip and pin. pin Even if you yeah. get a pin, it's not really a pin. So make okay. sure you go to the cash part. 
and I've gone on back roads and yeah, we got lost, but you really can find your way. GPS is a wonderful thing. Um, but it really is an easy place to drive. The only thing I would warn you is that if you're going to go into the Luberon, which is where all those um, lavender fields are and the well-known red clay mountains, um, a lot of those are two lane roads. And if you get stuck behind a truck, it's going to be a longer drive. Passing is tough, although they pass a lot. So, you know, that's where you want to really um, think about maybe getting a driver for that day to go there. It's it's absolutely doable, but it is winding up to the mountains to lane roads. If you've ever seen the Tour de France, the bicycle race, yeah. um, they go through there and they go to Mont Saint-Victoire, which is the highest kind of mountain range. And you'll see it's just a two lane road <laughs> going up there. But it's so, otherwise, Kim, when you go, it difficult. When you go and you take uh, you take me, uh, you should get Paul to do some biking through there, right? <laughs> yeah, he'd probably right. love that. I know it'd be, I, yeah, he he he'd love that, I'm sure. But I would be scared the whole time that he was going to be hit by a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the French are very big cyclists, so you might be absolutely safe. Yeah. If you have kids, I would probably stick to hiking in the mountains and biking in the valleys around Saint Remy or that, that area. That sounded lovely when you mentioned that. Yes. And to mention the Côte d'Azur, which is everybody's idea of the Riviera. Mm-hmm. And you have to know it goes from Saint-Tropez, that Saint-Tropez, to Nice, and onward to Monaco. What you also need to know is many of the beaches import sand, and if they don't, it's a pebble beach. And they are narrow. This is not the white, oh, big fine. sand beaches of the U.S. And while there are public beaches... Um, many of them um, have side-by-side chairs and rows and, you know, you just you have to rent a chair if you want access to that stretch of the beach. And many of the hotels have their own little beach or, you know, you have an, they have a, an affiliation with the beach and you pay and then you can get food service because let's not forget about the food. This is a very central part of France. <laughs> Is so, it hard to to visit one of those for a day? Like I would imagine trying to drive through their park and then find someone to rent a, a chair, like they probably sell out. Is it difficult Is, if you're just visiting for a day? It will be crowded, but you can do it. There's always room on certain beaches. Um, you'll pay a fortune for parking in season because you'll never get an on-street parking. But it can be done, but you have to realize you'll be sitting side by side with other people I don't know necessarily all the different definitions of which beaches are popular. Mm -hmm. Um, Cannes, which is well known, but is is really can be very commercial on its back streets. But if you're staying in one of the bigger hotels um, that have kids programs, there's bound to be family friendly um, areas there. Personally, I prefer the area further east, kind of between Cannes and Nice, you have Antibes, which has a wonderful um, old town with a great market, fabulous food, and it has a Picasso museum that's very well known. And then uh, Jean Les Pins, a little town attached to it, and that has um, lovely hotels and beaches. But again, they're not the broad, expansive beaches. You can go further east toward Monaco to Aise or Villefranche, and some of those are beautiful small towns. But again, the beaches will be rocky or pebbly, or if they're nice and they're maintained, you're, you're going to have to pay to go on it. Yeah. What was what was the beach area? So the beaches you had mentioned prior, uh, I believe, in the Provence region or the other? Well, from Provence, you're not actually by the beaches. You can drop from Provence, from, say, Aix-en-Provence, it's 45 minutes, down to Cassis, as in, um, you know, the liquor you put, not yep. the liquor, the flavoring. Red currants, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. That's yeah. it. And they have or the black famous, currants, I mean, yeah. <laughs> they have the famous calanque, which are the cliffs carved out in the water. And you can take boat tours. Cassis is a little beach town. It can be a little tacky, but you, that has a free beach as well. And there are some nice hotels there. Okay. And that goes up to Bondol, like the, um, like the wine. Um, and those can be very pleasant. Some are a little tackier than others. But really, Provence is not the beach, and that's what everybody doesn't understand. You have to drive to Saint-Tropez, and even Saint-Tropez is on the water. It's actually um, Rambutel, I think, is the town where all the beaches are. And you have to know from Saint-Tropez, it's very hard to get to Nice 
you, there is no train connecting them, but you can take a two-hour boat tour, which can be fun. Okay. Um, the boat will take you there. So do you have any other regions that might be on a list for families to visit? Um, there are two more regions that are great fun and very family-friendly, and that is um, the area around Bordeaux, also accessible from Paris by TGV, or you can connect easily. It's a major airport. Um, that would lead into the wine regions of Bordeaux and Saint-Emilion, and that is a UNESCO town, and that has just really revitalized. And just next to it is Biarritz, which is a very famous beach town, very family-friendly. Um, you are on the Atlantic there, so the water can be a little cooler. And then if you proceed a little further south, um, basically you can take the train to Toulouse, you have the Dordogne area, also full of outdoor areas. That's where the famous prehistoric painted caves are. You actually don't go into the original ones anymore. They've been closed off because of deterioration from too much traffic, but they've created ah. marvelous recreations. And you can also do the canoeing down there and the hiking and the cycling. And there's tons of good food, as there is throughout France. And again, some of the northernmost uh, Cathar castles are from there. That is adjacent, once again, to the Languedoc region. So those are all very family-friendly, very outdoorsy areas with, you know, some cultures such as the prehistoric caves of Bordeaux has some wonderful architecture and history behind it. So um, you really have a plethora of areas to choose and not just the ones that um, everybody thinks about. And each area will have its own unique character and uh, ambiance and atmosphere that's very different. And it's unique food because every region of France has something for which they're famous. So Kim, you ready to go? I, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you're, I'm you're going to pull like, out a map and start looking at all these I, regions. Right? Yes, I have to re-listen because that's the other thing is I cannot picture when she says it. I'm sure once I looked on the map, I could figure out where she's talking about. So yeah, I would, I'm eager to go. It sounds like a great vacation of food and wine and castles and beaches and charming little towns. And I kind of have a bell, you know, memory in my mind. Do you know where Beauty and the Beast, like the, the concept of that? I wonder if that was filmed at all in France, those cute little towns and markets. Um, it was Gascony. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whereabouts is that? That's where, you know, the one of the three musketeers was. It's basically La France Fonde, the deep France. Oh. So I'm not exactly sure. You'll have to, I have Look to admit. Look it up better, I, yeah. No. I know Mia would love that, you know, if it worked. But it sounds like it's... The southwest like part of France. Yeah. It sounds like it's kind of... You know, it's interesting to know, and I'm so glad we spoke to you because I wouldn't have not, you know, with it being European and I wouldn't have thought that the train travel would be that broken up and that it really has to be plotted and planned. You just imagine, you know, routes all over the place. So it's good to know for a little bit of extra planning on that. And I feel like that, that Beauty and the Beast concept, like it also looks a little bit like Als Alsace, right? Yes, I think, I think Gascony might be be south of Alsace, but honestly, I would look it up. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> but it was definitely German influence, but I'm yes. not sure if that's Disney German influence because right. they were so influenced by the castles of Bavaria. They, they looked at those towns a lot. Yeah. But Alsace is really one of my favorite. It can get quite hot in August, but it really is one of my favorite areas nice. to explore, and I think one of the most family-friendly areas and under and least discovered areas in France. That's great to know. So, what do you think a family uh, needs to budget for a vacation to France? Maybe, you know, thinking of airfare or what is food like, and what are the hotel costs like around there? Well, I would say you have to figure about ten to twelve thousand. You might be able to get away with it less staying in smaller towns, Airbnbs, and depending on when you chose to travel. June is very much high season. July and August in Provence, they're just marking everything up enormously. Um, but you do have to remember that France invented the takeout. So you can get the most wonderful roast chicken at almost any market. You can get prepared meals relatively inexpensively and just pop them into your local oven if you're cooking. And cafes are much less expensive than, say, your Michelin restaurant. 
which will be up there. But even in a Michelin restaurant, we ate in the kitchen of one for 100 euros a person. And for my son, who is a picky eater, they charged us 25 euros. Hmm. So, you know, remember, though, you're not going to get chicken fingers in France. You can get steak fleet, steak and french fries. You can get a chocolate mousse or vanilla ice cream. But... You can get grilled chicken. You're just not going to find chicken fingers. You're not going to find a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But you can grab a baguette off any corner and a lot of prepared sandwiches from um, patisserie, which really cut down on the cost. And, of course, picnics. You go to these markets, you make yourself a picnic, and you trot along with that. And uh, That sounds perfect it, to me. <laughs> That's, I, I would be more into that than even the Michelin restaurants, but Tamara knows that. I'm not the foodie. <laughs> What have you experienced with budgeting airfare uh, to get to? If you can plan well in advance, there were some deals. I think we waited a little too long last year because of some family issues. And I think it ran to 800 or $900. If you're willing to go via another city, like a Norwegian Air or Iceland Air or one of those, you can get cheaper airfares. But I have to admit that that's not my expertise. Okay. Yeah, I have a friend that's gone a couple of times. Even in the summer, she found a fare for under $500, which is shocking. But it's definitely doing, like you said, Norwegian or Iceland, like through another city. But I would think I would think even 800 in the summer, Barbara, was, was probably a pretty good deal. Mm-hmm. I feel like with Italy, so many times in coach in the summer can still be 1400 or more, you know? Yeah, and you know, it, it varies from year to year and deals that are going on and what you're... Um, what city you're starting from. So it's very hard to just give a flat out price there. Right. Um, coming from the West Coast, it'd probably be more expensive. You know, yes. it's it's hard to pair it that way. <laughs> Kim's often uh, lamenting the West yes. Coast thing and how easy it is for us to get to Europe. And then I'm coming back at her with how often she gets to Hawaii. But, <laughs> yeah. You know, we each have our benefits there. Yeah. So you gave some good some good money saving tips, I think. Do you have any other uh, general tips for things that people should know before they go to France? And I think one of the questions I have also is, how much French do you really need to know? Because yes. that's my that's what scares me off. Um, the French can be very snobby about their language. There's just no two ways about it. But some of these regions are very very friendly. Alsace, because it's where the EU is headquartered and a university town, they actually do. Sp- speak a fair amount of English. And one of the things we were able to do, for example, is go to the tourist office and pick up a Hastings tour pamphlet for 10 euros. And you could get it in English. And we'd go and we'd stop and we'd show them the pamphlet. And there was a specific food you got there. And it was no problem. If you go down um, near Saint-Rémy in Provence, that area tends to have a lot of Brits. And so they will speak more English. I think I have sent uh, clients to Dordogne and to Languedoc and Bordeaux who don't speak French, and they have all muddled through fairly well. And, you know, if you have kids, they generally smile, and they'll do really their best to help you. And remember, this isn't a third-world country. Anything you forget, you can pretty much find in a local um, pharmacy or a monoprix, which would be kind of like a target. I mean, if you need a knife to cut something for a picnic, go there and you'll pick it up for five euro. Mm-hmm. I still have mine. Nice. Did you have any other tips that you would recommend? If for some reason your child gets sick and it has happened to us, doctors are very inexpensive. Pharmacies are very helpful. And I have found if you go, if you need a doctor, you go into a pharmacy, they can re- recommend it. Or generally, all the hotels have somebody that they send you to. And many of the doctors will speak limited, but understandable English. And then they just, I think it cost us 15 or $20 for the doctor visit and another 15, 10 or $15 for the antibiotics my son needed. Hmm. Um, so remember, the pharmacy is a good resource. It's, it's more than uh, a CVS here in the U.S., and they'll be very helpful. And as long the big thing to know, it's a real sign of politeness. Anytime you walk into any store, anytime you start any conversation, say bonjour and end with au revoir. It's considered extremely rude not to greet or say goodbye, even if you buy nothing. It's just the polite thing to do, and that will win you many bonus points. 
That's a good tip. Yeah, I I think that I always worry because my nieces, they actually were in, have been in French immersion in Canada and they took a trip over there and they would immediately pick up that the French wasn't right and they would just switch to English even though the girls were supposed to be over there to practice their French. So, and it seemed they they felt that they were very impatient and wouldn't let them try to speak French. So have you experienced that? Even if you want to try, they don't even want you to? Um, I would say you find that more maybe in Paris than okay. outside of Paris. Okay, that's good to know. And they're also trying to be helpful. Yeah, exactly. I think they're just, you know, trying to be quick about it, right? Yeah. That's very helpful to know. So any other final tips? Um, You can rent portable Wi-Fi devices within France. They'll send it to basically a home or a place to hold. And if you have found that you have multiple devices for multiple children, I think it holds up to seven uh, devices and it varies. The cost is not prohibitive depending on the plan you have with your provider in the U.S. And then we rented that. My son would play on his iPad during some of the longer drives and we had GPS. And I believe it's called Wi-Fi. I have to look at the exact name. Yeah. Um, but that can be a very useful thing to have around. And then you're not worrying always about your data or how much your plan is charging per day. You have to work the numbers out to see if how that works with your company. Yeah, those, those are helpful. I've done that before. When I went to Israel, I rented one of those. Um, and I know there's a few different companies. We used one in California as well. And they're like little kind of Wi-Fi hotspots that, you, that I've experienced that you can rent for like $10 a day and you get a gig or something. Um, every day and then it limits your speed once you go over that but those are really helpful and definitely useful for families all right barbara well you covered a lot of different regions but one of the questions that we ask all of our guests is what do you think is the best place to take a family photo to remember the trip so do you have any favorites there um i think it's a little tough with the variety of regions but any child in front of a beautiful castle or in Alsace, some of the colorful, reconstructed medieval towns. Of course, with the scene of the Côte d'Azur behind is great. And finally, one of my favorite ones is by the Pont du Gau, the aqueduct in Rome, um, as we were canoeing underneath. That was just a kind of iconic picture. Yeah, I love seeing pictures of that. Great. And our final question that we ask all of our guests is, what do you wear when you travel? And maybe you have something specific with how you pack and what you wear for a trip to France. (laughs) Well, the French tend to be very correct. So if you're going to do tank tops and cut off shorts, that's fine during the day, but I wouldn't wear them any place nicer. I personally have a pair of great walking sandals by Echo that are actually patent leather leather, and I have them in brown and in black and so they're great to walk in but then they look quite presentable at night. Um, Sundresses are great things for women obviously it doesn't work for men. Um, In the more casual areas down south you can wear nice shorts uh, out to dinner men. Uh, Women tend to go more sundress oriented. Sneakers are the hot thing. Tight jeans are the hot thing and then in winter I have a pair of Paul Green loafers that have very thick kind of vibram soles and yet are very attractive looking so you can wear them both in and out so I try to have versatile shoes because otherwise you'll take a million pairs of shoes (laughs) and while the French always like to look chic they're not necessarily going to wear spiked heels or the most fashionable high-end couture clothing they can't afford it either it's just they believe there's a time and place for each set of clothing if people if you understand what I mean. It makes sense. Definitely. Well, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge about France with us. And can you tell people maybe where they can find you online or if they wanted to get in touch with you to help plan a trip? I can be reached at Barbara at Ciao Bambino. That's B-A-R-B-A-R-A at C-I-A-O B-A-M-B-I-N-O dot com. I can also be followed on Instagram at Barbara Windling Travels. Uh, My last name is W-E-I-N-D-L-I-N-G, and then travels is plural. And those are the best ways of reaching me. And on Facebook, you'll see me, um, Barbara Windling, although you will see a lot of child photos there, I have to admit. (laughs) Great. Thank you, Barbara. I'm excited. It makes me even 
you know, more excited for a trip to France and going beyond Paris. So that's very nice. Well, thank you for having me. I think you have a wonderful program. Thank you. Au revoir, right? Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we are back with our tip of the week. And since we're talking about France, I just wanted to give you a little bit of advice that when you're planning a trip, I know with Barbara, we talked a lot about taking the TGV train around France. And just so you know, those train tickets uh, sell about, they don't open up until 90 days in advance. So you can look at the calendar and get a sense of when the trains will be running, but you need to set yourself a reminder to book those out um, up to 90 days in advance. And also with the Eiffel Tower, I know when I was there a long time ago, you could kind of just go to the tower and buy a ticket and go up. But now they actually sell timed entry tickets and those also go on sale 90 days in advance. And you really have to buy those uh, in advance because they do sell out. And you will also need to look and decide if you want to go to the second level or go all the way up to the top because those are different tickets. And even when you get there, you do have to wait in a line and then you'll have to wait in another line to take an elevator all all the way to the top. So those are just some things to be aware of because it is such a popular attraction that if you go and you haven't bought tickets in advance, you could spend a couple hours waiting in line just for your ticket, which is certainly no fun. Yeah. It's not how I want to spend my vacation time in France. (laughs) Exactly. Great. Well, thanks for that tip. And I wanted to give a shout out to everyone and just ask for reviews, please, whatever you are listening on. A lot of us listen on our Apple Podcasts app, but also Stitcher or Google or wherever you're at. Please take a moment and leave us a review. It would mean so much to us. It really helps us show up more in the searches and then just, you know, also helps us know that we're doing something you guys like. So please leave a review on your podcast app. We would appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much. We're coming up on two years now, so we w- we need a little encouragement from you guys, and we want to hear what you like and what you want to hear more of. And you can join us next week. We are going to be chatting all about some of our favorite money-saving tips because vacations can get expensive. And even if you're planning, you know, upscale or luxury travel, it never hurts to know kind of some tricks to save a little bit of money. So we are going to be sharing both of our takes on how we make family travel more affordable. Great, and we will talk to you then. Thank you.